Welcome to the Film Entrepreneur Podcast, episode number 25. I would rather hustle for 24 7 than slave from 9 to 5. Mongo Wilder. This is the Film Entrepreneur Podcast, where we teach you the top strategies, tactics, and growth hacks that every indie filmmaker needs to know to make money with their films. We are the podcast that puts the business back into show business. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Film Entrepreneur Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films. From predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them, the odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. Before I get started, I just want to thank everybody in the tribe for all the love that I'm getting back from the new book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur. I've been reading the reviews. I've been checking out all the messages and social media posts you've been doing about the book. It is everything I wanted and more. I really hope that this book sparks a revolution inside the indie film community. And I really, truly thank you for all the love and support you guys have given me on the book. And if you like the book, please don't forget to leave a review on Amazon or wherever you purchased it. But more importantly, share this book, share the ideas of this book with five of your filmmaking friends. We need to get this information out to as many filmmakers as possible, old, new, I don't care. Get the information out to everybody because it could really change the course of that filmmaker's life. And it is the best Christmas gift you could give them. Now, today's guest comes straight from the pages of Rise of the Film Entrepreneur. Today's guest is Daedalus Howell, and he is the director of a new film called Pillhead. Now, how he distributed and how he created the project from inception is quintessential film entrepreneurship. He used one of my methods called the regional cinema model. Now, this is when you create a movie or a series or content for a geographical area. It could be your neighborhood. It could be your town. It could be your city. Something that really speaks to that community. And you make it for a low enough budget where then you can galvanize the entire community around that movie and then you can make a business doing films like this and that's exactly what he did he created a movie called pillhead which is basically an art house exploitation or an art exploitation film i forgot what he called it but it's an art house film and in his area up near san francisco it is a very art house kind of community they love art house films they love kind of quirky arty films and he decided look i'm gonna make this and he did it uh and i forgot the exact budget you have to listen in the episode but i think it was around thirty thousand dollars or out of his own pocket after he got investors and got donations and things he only had to spend like seven or eight thousand dollars out of his own pocket to make this thing and he even talked his way into free mind you free screenings at all the local theaters where they four-walled his film for free, just on a revenue split. That's unheard of with a small, like, indie, micro-budget indie movie. But he was able to do that. And, by the way, he was in those theaters for weeks, and he did very, very well theatrically. And that was just one of the multiple revenue streams he created for this project. And he's doing more of these kinds of projects so he could build a portfolio of films like this to keep this process going. So I really wanted to dig deep into how he used the regional cinema model in the distribution and creation 
of his new film, Pillhead. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Daedalus Howell. I'd like to welcome to the show Daedalus Howell, man. How are you? I'm grand, man. How about you? Thank you so much, man. I appreciate you reaching out to me and coming on to the to the podcast and hopefully being, you know, dropping some knowledge bombs from your experience because I always look for unique uh, as you know, unique ways of looking at film. And you 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 hit something I hadn't heard before. Hey, how about using your hometown as a backlot? I'm like, that's a podcast. So I had I had nowhere else to go, Alex. <laughs> I had nowhere else to go. <laughs> and now I'm with you. I appreciate <laughs> I, I appreciate it, man. So first of all, man, what made you want to become a filmmaker? Like why did you want to become a carny? <laughs> Well, that's a great question. I, you know, I, I should back up and tell you I'm from Petaluma, California, and what you may or may not know about Petaluma, uh, we're north of San Francisco a little bit. This is a movie town, and so Same. we were surrounded by all kinds of film phenomena, beginning with like American Graffiti, which was shot here, uh, Lucas, <gasps> Peggy Sue Got Married was shot here, Coppola, uh, and then through the '90s, and Benny the Abbots, Phenomena, the Lolita remake, uh, Flubber. I mean, it was crazy the amount of like cinematic immersion just in production that was here for a while and so growing up in that you get the bug compounding that uh lucasfilm was just over the hill in marin right, right. and then you throw in winona Ryder going to petaluma high and this is like super film consciousness in terms of a town and so a lot of us grew up with uh yeah my cohort and i with this fantasy that we could do it too and of course that was summarily crushed you know once we all went to hollywood and <laughs> and you know as everyone goes through that process and so so i had the bug pretty early and i had to really figure out how i was going to like deal with having that in my system uh, i became a writer uh, pretty early on uh, for local newspapers and that kind of thing so i was able to kind of build a a film adjacent career i could i could interview film people mm -hmm. and when i did uh, finally go to los angeles in like the early 2000s I was principally, uh, you know, an aspiring screenwriter, had some minor breaks, that kind of thing. But, you know, I washed out and, and I was left with the disease, you know, the virus was in me. I wanted to make a film and it got so bad, man. Um, that after, I mean, <laughs> you know, the infection was riddling me. Uh, I, was, I, I, <laughs> I always refer to the bug or the thing to become a filmmaker. It's like herpes. Like it yeah, literally, right, right. it's, it, it, once you get it, you've got it for life. It will flare up sometimes, but sometimes it's dormant. But no matter what, it will flare up eventually again. And then you'll, and then sometimes it's really bad and you just start like, oh man, turn into a crack fiend. But go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's a great metaphor because it's really what happened. And it got, it got to the point where I, I began to for, forbid myself to like read about, you know, read film books, to uh, look at anything <laughs> about indie film because I didn't want the flare up to come back because I was feeling so negative about myself from never having done it. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. And then I just, I, I, I got in a situation where I was between jobs and my, uh, my partner, my uh, girlfriend said, Hey, um, what do you really want to do now? You know, well, you, it's kind of wide open. And I said, well, what I really want to do is direct. <laughs> and she didn't know much about production or anything like that. So she didn't know it was impossible. And so she became a film producer and I became a writer director. And it was just, it was just the, the drive to do it that, that compelled me. But it was really just, uh, you know, after, you know, you did this with, uh, uh this is Meg, mm -hmm. uh, 15 years or whatever, you know, you're like, why haven't I done it? There's no really excuse not to apart from manifesting the drive to do so. And so that's what we finally did. No, I mean, I, I mean, I had a, I had a horrible experience with a mobster in Hollywood. So that right. kind of, that kind of, that kind of stained me. Uh, and, uh, I haven't read that book yet though. I'm going to though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is, it is, uh, it, it definitely, I, I realize it subconsciously stopped me from ever going back in. Like, why would you go back to the most painful time in your life and you associate making a movie with the most painful time in your life? So I had an excuse. It was a horrible <laughs> one, but I had an excuse uh, why I didn't do it. But at a certain point, you know, you and I are both of, of, of similar vintages. Uh, right. You know, at a certain point, you just go, dude, I'm not 20 anymore. Like, I can't keep, I can't keep doing this. Yeah. But the problem is when you bring that filmmaker identity into your consciousness and you're mm -hmm. carrying it that long and you haven't made the, Ooh. you know, the feature film, your life is all plot and no story, man. You, you, you start like, you start questioning who you are. And of course, mm. all your friends are like, dude, are you, you're, so you're a filmmaker? Really, dude? I mean, where's your movie? And you've got a bunch of shorts on YouTube. Who are you? You know, it's right. like, it's, it's so, 
it, yeah, you just have to do it. You just have to do it. Yeah, you're going to do it. Yeah. yeah, and then I, I hid behind, you know, I did direct like little commercials or music videos and things like that, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. And I hid behind post. So I was like, right. I was, it was kind of like nice. It's adjacent. It's, it, you're kind yeah. of, you're still a filmmaker, but you're not doing exactly what you want to do. So it's a great experience, but you hide. You hide in that, in that world. So for me, I hid there for God knows about 20 years. Yeah. Uh, doing yeah. it. Yeah. And then he did a podcast, and that, you know, <laughs> he hid behind the podcast. And then I hid behind the podcast and behind this. My, I'll be honest with you, though. I'll be honest with you. If it wasn't for the podcast and if it wasn't for the tribe, I don't think I would have made This Is Meg. The reason why I, there was two reasons I did it was because, one, I wanted to prove uh, to the tribe that it could be done. I wanted to prove to myself it could be done. I also wanted to use the tribe as something that, to keep me um, – to keep me, uh, uh, what's that word? Ah, uh, not compatible, but um, when you're trying to, uh, uh, when you're trying to do something and someone tells you, like, is watching you. I forgot that word, that term. I, I'm losing my. Yeah. Um, we'll never uh, find it now. We'll never find it. It's over now. Uh, I'm sure someone's yelling at it in their car at the right. moment, but, <laughs> but, uh, but I did it for that reason, and then also for whatever odd reason, because I it was still doing indie film hustle on kind of a side hustle still. It wasn't my full-time gig yet. Mm -hmm. I just said, well, if it doesn't work out, I always have indie film hustle. I could just go back to that. <laughs> so it's like my safety blanket, you know, and it's become this kind of like, oh, I, I'm good. I'll just go out. I, I, it made me more brave to just go out there where it might scare other people because you're like putting yourself out there. I, it's the opposite for me. I find it very comforting knowing that I have an, I have not only an audience, but I have a tribe, I have a community that I could always go back to. And if it doesn't work, eh, it doesn't work. Yeah, you know? no, that's, that's really, I think that was one of the smartest moves you've clearly one of the smartest <laughs> moves you've made, you know, and, and you did, I mean, you've definitely galvanized the community. I mean, I'm, I, you know how they say like the velvet underground had a hundred fans, but each one of them started a band, you know, <laughs> right. You've got well more than a hundred fans, but uh, I, I, there's going to uh, someday some film historian is going to trace back this explosion of independent film, oh. and they're going to be able to blame one man. They're going to go <laughs> oh Alex Ferrari, and you know that would be find amazing. You, you know yeah. what? I, honestly, that would be the most wonderful thing ever. Because if I, you know, I'm here just to help, and I want to, I want to, I want that, and I get these stories like yours and and other people who've listened to the podcast for a long time. Like I finally made my movie. I finally did this thing, mm -hmm. uh, but now it's my my job to teach you how to make money with it. But that's why you're here because yes. you have a unique story behind it. Now, tell me about your film, Pillhead. Because so first, Pillhead, great name, great name. Oh, thank you, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the general gist is uh, a young art student takes too many pills and wakes up in what's probably a parallel universe. And it's all about finding her way back to her reality, whatever that may be, in a sort of redemptive Alice in Wonderland kind of phenomena. However, we went at this sort of, you know, uh, Typical sci-fi style plot, I think, uh, with an art house vengeance, and so I call it an art exploitation film. This thing, I just, if it, it, it's like your first year in film school, you take a mm -hmm. survey course, and it's all Jean-Luc Godard and Truffaut and all that kind of thing. Right. I checked every box I could, man. It's black and white. Uh, it's it's moody. It's handheld. It's it's an aesthetic kind of like uh, hat tip to uh, uh, you know the the French New Wave and all the films I grew up on and that kind of thing. And so it scratched a lot of itches, you know that, that the flare up was real. <laughs> and and so it's it's a very different kind of movie, and it doesn't really fit into the general indie landscape, which. It's a stumbling block in some ways and sort of its differentiator in other ways. And and I was able to play that to my advantage. Once once I accepted that this is my aesthetic, there's no way around it. I, I have to make the film I'm gonna make, uh, but I have to make it in a way that it's meaningful to my audience. And I know and I knew pretty much who they were because I'm in local media and that kind of thing. And I knew that I wasn't gonna make the kind of film that was gonna scale and explode. I was making a regional film. I was making a film that was gonna be meaningful to where I'm from and the people in my community. And that sounds a little backwards because you want your film to be as big as possible mm -hmm. often. You want it to go everywhere. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm really hooked on this notion of regional cinema, the way that, uh, the, you know, there used to be like regional theater, right? There'd be like mm -hmm. a, you know, like a playhouse and then uh, they'd put on a regular program, that kind of thing. I wanted to start something wherein I could credibly create films and know that I had an audience here and do it on a regular basis. And the trick to that, of course, is making them inexpensively, making them profitable, and making them for an audience that you know is going to come back. And so I knew I was going to make a Petaluma film. 
That's a, that's that's a really so that's what regional cinema the regional cinema model is for you because that's the first time I've heard that term. And is it? I yeah, don't know, I mean, it, it might it might, be, it might be out there in the zeitgeist, but I've never probably, heard of it. Yeah. yeah, I've never heard of it. And generally speaking, if I don't hear it, I've never heard of it. It's a weird thing because I'm I'm pretty much inside of this world all the time. So when I heard that, I was like, interesting. So now that's the definition of it. And I, honestly, it's a you know the, where we're taught as filmmakers, especially our generation, but even younger filmmakers, you, that everything's got to be huge. It's got to be big. It's got to be blockbuster. You've got to make a hundred million dollars. And, you know, what Film Entrepreneur is about is to start bringing it down, bringing it down to niche audiences, to bringing it down. Now you've created the um, the regional aspect of things, which is awesome because now you are, you're doing basically what I've been preaching, but doing it on a regional standpoint as opposed to a niche. It is a niche, but it's a it regional a niche. niche. Yeah. But it's yeah. a regional niche. And if you as a filmmaker have a region that you know that you can sell movies to and you can make those movies for a budget and you can recoup your money and continue to make, that's a business. That That's a business. And if it goes somewhere else and it goes international or it sells outside online somewhere to a bigger audience, fantastic. But your core audience is what is going to sustain your career. That's a really powerful thing. And it also gets out of you. It gets that lottery ticket mentality out of, the filmmaker's head, which is like, I need to make something. This movie's got to pop for me. I need to go to Hollywood. I need to do. You don't. You don't. You could keep it small. And as long as you're cool with not living in the Hollywood Hills and you could just have a lifestyle, you know, buy a house, you know, pay your rent, you know, and enjoy it, like make money, make enough money to sustain you and your family comfortably and make your art. Well, hell, that's the dream. No, that's that's you're totally right. And that's the metrics of, of success. Can you do it again? Is it supporting you versus like you're saying the lottery ticket where it's supposed to make your career overnight? That's just not going to happen anymore. You know, unless you're in a, that system, which, you know, I would have I would gamble most of uh, most everyone listening is not clustered in Hollywood. Maybe they are. But but even but, if you're here, but even if yeah. you're here, it's a lottery ticket. There's one guy like like you and I were were raised in the in the 90s like we came up in the film industry like in the 90s with independent film like every freaking week there right. was Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez, Kevin Smith, Richard Linklater, Spike Lee, John Singleton. I mean it just kept you know Steven Soderbergh every week there was a new magic lottery ticket being handed out and yeah, that Sundance was just stamping these guys out. Oh and, my god. And, 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 it, it led us to believe that that's the system. That's what you do. You sh- you show up, it happens, and it doesn't. And that could be that could really derail your life artistically. You know? <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> so yeah. So so I you know I had to really pull back and figure that out. And once you scale stuff to to not just a level where you can actually make it, but you know who's going to watch it, and you know that you're going to earn it back and 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 beyond, it it changes your mindset. And there's a lot more freedom in it. You know, uh, especially if you know your niche, or you know what you're doing now. And and I totally agree with you. Regional cinema is a niche, and the niche is the region in this case. And I and I grew, you know, this the, where I live is, is is it's a very special place, and so I knew it is fairly dependable. And but there there are ways to to galvanize that and make it happen. And um, so we set about. Uh, with our production, uh, and, and I have to tell you, from the like I, I was talking earlier about the arts exploitation factor, this I knew this is going to be intrinsically not a mass market film. There's just no mm. way about it. Sure. But I knew, and, and, and if I did anything other than that, I wouldn't. I wasn't going to be, you know, my artistic integrity and all that BS wasn't going to be intact. But if you're going to make a film at our age, after not having made a film, you're going to make your goddamn film the way you want to make absolutely. it. Right? So, absolutely, absolutely. So, so I had to dovetail that into a concept. That would work. Uh, and so I was on a radio program yesterday and a uh, guy pointed out, he goes, hey, Petaluma is kind of a character. And I'm like, that's right. You know, the town, I, I made the town look, I wouldn't say beautiful, but I gave it a, a vision that uh, that this town hasn't seen itself uh, that way before. And, and and I think that had resonance, you know, and that's something that's talked about a lot. But to kind of like roll back and like how to do this kind of thing, uh, you're going to need a lot of favors. <laughs> you're going to need a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of buy-in from like the sort of civic, you know, like bureaucracies that you, you have to participate in. Uh, and you're going to have to become friends with the local press. And you're going to have to have to have a story that's beyond local filmmaker does good, you know, because oh, yeah. we've seen that story, right? Yeah, it's not 1982. Yeah. <laughs> no one cares. No one cares. <laughs> Everyone's making a movie right now. You know, they'd right. rather write about the YouTube kid than they would you. So. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I I just hunkered down and wanted to tell the story that I told. And uh, 
but I wanted to make the film. I didn't want to do too much guerrilla stuff. I knew that I had to do it legally by that. I mean like permits and insurance and all the things. And I needed to, uh, uh, keep it cheap, lean and, uh, fairly invisible because I couldn't afford to close off streets. I couldn't afford to, uh, I, I couldn't ask any businesses to stop their business for me, that kind of thing. And so the first thing was, uh, you know, to ensure the production, you have to be permitted. And to get that permit, I had to uh, appeal to the city of Petaluma. And I go to them and, you know, so in, in Petaluma, as I mentioned before, has been, has seen a lot of film, right? Mm -hmm. And and they're used to big budgets coming in and they make, this is, cities make money on movies through tra transitory occupancy tax. That means heads and beds, right? Crew comes in, 50 plus people or more, they, uh, those people are put up at hotels. They're eating at local restaurants, local services. So films can be a big money maker for a city. So when you come in and say, "I got this little itty bitty film, uh, please give me a film permit," they're like, yeah, "Well, okay, uh, sure. We're not going to deny you your your freedom of speech, but what's in it for us?" Especially since, in my case, I wanted a discount. And no one thinks that you can negotiate with a bureaucracy, but you totally can, especially the smaller your town, because the mayor is your neighbor, right? Mm -hmm. So I wrote. A letter to the city manager. They wanted, I think, two hundred bucks a day or two twenty five a day or something like that. You know, that was their deal. Two two hundred twenty two twenty five, and I had like a twenty day shoot. Right? That's not a significant amount of money to the city. It's like what four grand or something like that. But to me, that was like a budget breaker. Right? Mm -hmm. So I wrote a letter to the city manager, an email, and I said, Hey, here's the deal. I'm a townie. I'm a local. Everyone here is local. It's locally cast. It's all this. Here's the general pitch. And uh, the guy wrote back and said, How about three hundred bucks flat rate? in done i'm like isn't that great you can do that right and so uh then i went through fractured atlas uh which is a nonprofit uh sort of fiscal sponsor you know they're uh if you can't uh receive donations yourself because you're not a nonprofit, uh they'll they'll vouch for you and receive those funds and they have an amazing insurance uh, pol uh policy situation where they've worked out they broke out some deals so they get discounted insurance for production so i was able to take that get discounted insurance, which is what the city wants. They don't want, to want you to mess up anything and they want sure. to make sure. So then I had to go, most cities will ask you to go to the local merchants. It's usually like a chamber of commerce or a downtown merchant society or something like that uh, because their main concern, and this was a concern in Petaluma, and it kind of led to a lot of productions being shut down or, or not even shut down, like blocked from coming in. Merchants complain about sh streets being shut down, Sidewalk traffic ending, foot mm -hmm. traffic gone, no customers, right? Even if they're compensated by a studio or whatever, it's never enough. Everyone's grumpy, and it's so disruptive to local business. So when you have a lean little production like ours, uh, you're not going to impact in that way, but you got to tell them that. And that was the weird part. I didn't expect – uh, to go to a local business and say, hey, man, we're going to be shooting here. Here's my flyer. You have to you know, announce it that way. Uh, that's where I got the first bit of like pushback. I was like, dude, we're just a small – I mean we're, we're going to look like tourists. There's only five of us you know, and a camera. Mm -hmm. And they were so suspicious and so kind of like, mm -hmm. no, uh, we remember what happened last time. You know, like uh, you know, I can't remember the film, but it came – I think Scream was shot in, uh, locally and it, it, it ruined the town for a few weeks, right? So – they were pretty chapped about that, and uh, and I just had to sit down and talk with them. And eventually, I surfaced up to the uh, you know the the chairperson of the downtown association, and I just I, I just pled my case and made it clear to them that we're not going to shut anything down. This person happened to be a mason, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, I through that person's influence, everyone just jumped in. And then the Masons said, do you need a building to shoot in? I'm like, yeah. And they gave us their building. We shot in a Mason temple at one point. It was crazy, man. So awesome. It's so it's that, it's that local boy makes good angle, but more like we're doing this together. We're doing this for these reasons. This is how it aligns with what you're trying to do. And we're not going to cost you a thing. And, and we're not going to tell you, we're going to make your business look good. And it's going to be an advertisement for you or anything like that. But we are going to respect you and your business, and we're going to make this as seamless as possible, and we're going to make it fun for you. You you want a cameo? Great, you know <laughs> that kind of thing. And so oh, that's the power of the cameo. Oh, yes. yes, which is the most yeah, as everyone knows, the most BS thing ever because that usually it's the first thing gets cut, right? <laughs> that that and the associate producer credit. Oh but, my uh, god. <laughs> Got a couple of those. Yeah. Uh, now, do, uh, so that's what a merchant buy-in is. Is like that, that's, what is that that's exactly? That's how I would characterize it. Is it, because you're going to need the, the streets of your small town as if you're shooting 
looking at exteriors and you're using their storefronts and their backgrounds and that kind of thing, you're going to get location releases from them, you know, and that kind of stuff. And you're going to, you, you want them to, to love what you're doing versus being afraid that you're going to cost them money by blocking uh, their customers from getting in or intimidating people or people don't want to be on camera. People are afraid of being caught up in something. People don't want to be in a movie called Pillhead. I, I get it, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, so it, you start just on, literally on the street level, going door to door, saying, "This is what we're doing. We're we're insured. We're playing by all the rules. We're not going to make a mess, and and we're gonna we're gonna try to make this a pleasurable process for everyone." And uh, in most of the time, they they get into it. We actually we gained more locations than we we were a threat of losing because people said, "Hey, why don't you shoot my building too?" <laughs> you know. When we had a place that just schedule wise wasn't going to work out, another guy stepped up because he was like, "Yeah, you, this sounds like a lot of fun. You guys are, you know, doing a great thing here and that kind of thing." And so, that's that's a place to start on the street level, right? Now, what so, was the what was the budget of this film? Just a smidge under thirty thousand dollars. Okay, so it's a it's an afford, it's a low budget without it's a it's a argue arg, people will argue micro budget. Totally, uh, it's. I don't even think it qualified for the micro budget SAG agreement, um, the ultra low. I mean, no. we didn't. We paid. Uh, that's the thing. Here's the, to keep within the budget. We flat rated all the performers, and so sure. everyone got a hundred bucks a day yeah. across the board. And that and that's great because that kind of that keeps the spirit of the thing alive. Every, the, these people are getting paid. Mm-hmm. They're paid actors. That's mm-hmm. huge for them because we're often in small towns just starting their careers and that kind of thing. That's huge. I, is normally they wouldn't even get paid to be in a feature in, in a small town. So that's a big plus. You have to do it, you know. And mm-hmm. we had used we used a casting director. Remarkably, we have one up here. I guess because there's a lot of extras needed when the big films come in. Mm-hmm. So uh, and so this was the chance for the casting director to break some talent, and it was great for everyone. Uh, but we paid everyone, which makes them accountable, right? They show up, they take it seriously. Um, but at 100 bucks a day, I think the minimum for a SAG agreement is 125. I just couldn't make it pencil, man. So that was, they didn't get their, you know, SAG units, but they don't care. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's not about the SAG units. How many days did you shoot by the way? Uh, 20. And so here's the thing, man, in the middle of our production, uh, the big California fires in Northern California mm-hmm. happened and oh. Petaluma wasn't affected necessarily, but all the surrounding area was. And so we were smoked out and we had to shut down and reschedule, which was pretty traumatic for a small scale production. And there's a moment of course where I'm like, we're never going to get this done. This, this isn't going to happen. But uh, Karen Hass, our producer was able to like triangulate, work it out, get all of the merchants to come back on board on different days. You know, the first thing that happens though, when there's a catastrophe like that is that all of the monies, all of the, uh, donation kind of stuff, like the free catering and that kind of thing that goes right out the window because they're diverting that energy and, and resources to, you know, people who actually need it, mm-hmm. you know, fire victims and that kind of thing completely makes sense. But that, that was, that was something we never accounted for, of course. And we had to figure out how we're going to patch all these holes, you know, uh, fortunately there's a local woman who makes tamales. And so <laughs> we, we lived on tamales for a week or so, but it was, can, it was, uh, <laughs> no, can I tell, I want to tell you a quick story. Yeah, yeah. My first film broken was my first short film in 2005. We shot in a, uh, like an, it's arguably an abandoned hospital, but we like, there's four floors that are abandoned, but the rest of the hospital is functional. So like the basement was like, and it's like from the forties and the fifties, there was like ancient stuff. And like, there was entire, entire like floors full of props, basically. They'd just been sitting there for, for decades. And they're like, go have it, go at it. And they eventually originally were going to be for 500 bucks. And at the end of it, they had such a good time with it. So like, yeah, don't worry about it. So we got the whole place. We got the whole place for free. But the problem is the week before we were shoot, a hurricane hit us because we were in West Palm Beach. So a hurricane hit our area. And when we drove up there, like everything was destroyed. A lot of, a lot of (laughs) flooding happened, all of this stuff. So we just incorporated it all into the story. We just said, screw it. We'll just, we got to roll We're we're shooting in five days. This is happening. But the best part was that FEMA, because it was a hospital set up (laughs) shop there. Oh my God. And there was hundreds of thousands of people in line outside <laughs> while we're trying to shoot a movie. So you got to roll with the punches sometimes. You got to roll with it, man. Like now you have a great production design and a cast of thousands, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's yeah. That's, yeah. And that's, that's the thing though. When you're a lean, small production, you're, you can pivot like that, you know? Mm-hmm. And so if you do have a natural disaster, you, you can actually either incorporate it or, or at least in our case, reschedule and make it work. But so that, that was a setback, but, but, 
generally speaking, everyone was uh, appreciative and understanding of it and that kind of thing. And, and so throughout, um, our post-production, we kept everyone abreast of what was happening, that kind of thing. Cause once you go into post-production, like it's like your film disappears. No yeah, one you're cares. in a cave. You're in the cave for yeah. months. Totally. And no one knows what's happening or if it's ever going to, ha- or, or if it's ever going to happen. So we would <laughs> dribble content out. Well, I was going to ask you, did you, uh, you obviously understand who your target is, which you're very, it's a very, it's a niche audience, but it's a very broad, you know, you've got a lot of spectrum of people there. So how did you realize that your movie, which is an art, art exploitation film would, would resonate with this audience? Did you do any mark? Did you do any market testing? Did you like, what was the, the, other than just being shot in that town, do you think that was enough to gather everybody to come to see your movie. That was a start. That was definitely a platform that we could start with. Uh, but that's a great question. Uh, I knew that given the sort of demographic makeup here, it's a pretty arty town. We're very close to San Francisco, and there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of people who go back and forth between here and the city. So it's sort of it's it's a suburb. So it's got a kind of a cosmopolitan edge to it in some ways. Um, and the local movie theaters are multiplexes, uh, and, and have the usual stuff. And so there's no art house films as such. So I I always knew that I was going to pursue some kind of local theatrical distribution to kind of like, uh, to slake that thirst for that kind of content in this area. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we're blessed that, in that we got a couple of, uh, uh, like old school, uh, venues that used to be old movie theaters that can still do it that um, are now music venues and that kind of thing. And so I always had an eye to like reviving this art house phenomena in town. And so it was uh, a consortium, if you will, a consortium of yeah. local, um, <laughs> local exhibitors. So yeah, yeah, that's my joke. Cause it's, you know, every small town has, most small towns have movie theaters. Most of those movie theaters are going to be owned by somebody. Right. And, and that's often a local business person, or if it's a chain, uh, you can figure out where the basis of that chain is. And oftentimes they're regionalized you know, in, in, because of the nature of how these businesses are put together, they're often, uh, they could be like a big AMC theater, but they're actually local franchisees, that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. so, or, or some, I'm not sure for that particular chain, but that's how it often works. And so you can find uh, through just through some internet sleuthing, like who actually owns the theater, right? Uh, and it's usually a, a small company, that kind of thing. Up here, we had uh, for you know a fairly small market, relatively speaking, two separate exhibition companies, right? That between the two of them represented most of the theaters in town. And so I knew that those guys had to be my friends, right? And I needed to. Uh, make a case that our film would be worth the risk of of slotting, uh, uh, you know, against the Avengers in this case, you know. And so, what we did was, I uh, I knew that a good, healthy cast and crew screening would would. Uh, I just at this point, I had faith in the film. It was cut. We had a great mix. Uh, I knew that. I knew that we had something that was really going to make the town lose their shit, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I booked. A theater in town called the Mystic, which is one of these used to, one of these old single screen, funky, mm-hmm. fairly large venue, uh, beautiful place that has turned into a music venue, but they still had the screen. And I I approached them and I said, well, you know, what's your rate for a single night screening? We're near casting and crew, and it was like three thousand bucks. And again, you know, deal breaker for me. And so I made the case. I, this is a local film. It's local talent. It's local this, local that. I just really sold them on. Uh, this is your opportunity to be a hero to the cast and crew of this film and their friends and family and and bring new eyes to this theater who haven't seen it in this capacity in 30 years, right? Nice hustle. And they're stuff. like, yeah, it, it totally, exactly, total indie film hustle. And, and, uh, and they saw the merit in that, and they shaved it down to like a 1000 bucks. Then, which is great, still, that's a 1000 bucks, right? So then, in fact, I have one here. I got myself... A designer, my producer, and mm-hmm. we made a program, and then we sold advertising in that program, right, mm-hmm. to underwrite the production, or sorry, the the presentation of the cast and crew screening at this theater. So we sold a thousand bucks worth of advertising. Then, of course, these had to be printed. I go to the print shop. And I'm like, hey man, I could go to you know FedEx, Kinkos, or whatever. 
or we could keep it local, you know, Petaluma Printing, and and uh, we'll throw an ad in there. And uh, the guy just shaved it down to like practically zero. We had to staple them ourselves, but we totally hustled it, and we passed these out, and everyone was happy. And so, uh, you know, they're. And I, you know, and it's, if I could put them in the special thanks, I did, you know, the credit roll, but the film was pretty locked at that point. But, but all, you know, all these advertisers were like, you know, and of course they got to come to the screening because that's the thing, man, I wasn't selling any tickets, right? I told the cast and crew, come on down, bring as many friends as you want. The theater's capacity was a 300 or something like that. And I set it up uh, on Eventbrite so I can, I could register that capacity. And I wanted the, on Eventbrite, you know, they, they show you how many tickets are remaining, even though they're free, you want to see that number like dwindle and get down, down, mm-hmm. down. And, and then su- there's surges. Right. And so we packed that place beyond capacity. Right. We had a line out the door, which everyone wants to see. I invited all of the local press to see that line and the local exhibitors. So they come and they, they see this film. And of course, you know, it's cast and crew. Everyone's cheering. Every time some new face pops on, it's a round of applause, right? <laughs> and it was a really spirited, fun, up, great event. Uh, you know, the film's 80 minutes, so you're in and out, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Uh, but we kept the party atmosphere going. It was really great. And in that's, what happens is the press, the exhibitors, they come up to you. Like, that was really great. That was really exciting. You know, uh, what's your next step? Next step is a bunch of lunches the next week. We do a bunch of interviews and we do uh, some deals, right? And what we negotiated with the exhibitors, um, they have, uh, you know, theatrical exhibition, exhibi- ex- sorry, exhibition is kind of weird where they they need to, uh, they kind of lost lead on the film, right? In some way on films, right? So it's, they're, they're moving popcorn and concessions, that kind of thing for the first few weeks, right? Mm-hmm. Big film comes in. They they take a dive on the ticket price, uh, it, but there's there and then the longer the film stays there, the more their percentage of uh, the box office goes up, as you know. Correct. And so, uh, I knew that I, I couldn't really tolerate that threshold, you know, because I needed to make the, the, some money now at this point. And so, um, because of uh, the nature of of our our sort of. Uh, um, aware the where the awareness we had created in town and all that, and because I knew some press was coming up and all that, I was able to tell the story of getting into you know, how we're having local exhibition. It makes the film seem successful because no one gets distribution, mm-hmm. right? And you know, if unless you go out of a forty mile square radius, you don't know the film's not everywhere, right? right. It's, it's in the movie theater, right? And so uh, we did a, a straight up fifty fifty split, right? Which is it's huge for them. It's huge for them. You, yeah, and, and so. They got more money up front uh, on on a Thursday night from our little film than they did with Endgame, which is playing the theater next door because there's five guys in there, right? Because that film had been played out a little bit. And so it was a win for them and it was a win for us. And uh, and they have all their stuff wired. So like, you know, they're, they're taking the tickets and all that. And we had to invoice them at the end of the month. They send the money and the money shows up and it's great. And so we ran for a couple of weeks in four different uh, cities. That's the thing. That's what you don't want. Just one theater. You want to You want to leverage your press as, as wide as you can. And in as many markets as you can, even though it's ostensibly the same community and the same type of audience, they live in different places sometimes. And uh, we have enough regional media that I was able to like push that. And once you get one story, you can push that story to other places. I got lucky because one of the newspaper chains here uh, has a report. You know, they, they they're cheap on the reporters, so they get the one guy to write it, but they run it in three different papers, right? Mm-hmm. Fine by me. So here here's an example. You know, here's there's one clip, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, and this is of course the hard copy. It it, it has more of a life online. Mm-hmm. You know, there's another clip, <laughs> right? Same article. Same exact article. This one was different. This is a, a shot from the movie. This is the cover, man, of, of a, a local alternative news weekly. Um, and uh, they they just jumped on it, man. We made it a story uh, because we had 300 people who had a great time talking about how great it was and then looking that's for the it. paper. So, and, and that's how you do it, man. You, you, you start small and you keep it focused and you, and you knock on the doors that you know will open for you in your town and, uh, and you keep the spirit alive with it. And so, so this all – Snowballed to mm. our, our Amazon release, but anyway, that's that's kind of so, like the. So, how much did you make on this theatrical release? What was the kind of revenue, generally speaking? We were making about a thousand bucks a week, right? Okay. And so, it made a dent in in our uh, our initial outlay. And that's the other thing: the all the film was in part uh, underwritten by Indiegogo, right? Mm-hmm. Not significantly, but a few thousand bucks. We got a private donor, right, who came in for a couple grand to begin with, and then. Uh, midway through, I'm like, I need more money. And, and I, so I, I just, 
asked him again and he was cool enough and kicked, you know, kicked down another few grand. Uh, and our post, we did ourselves, we, we built our own, you know, system, uh, you know, uh, out of bits and pieces and used Premiere in this case. We got a real break though in the mix, uh, Central Post LA, uh, down there up, up Barham, uh, mm-hmm. did our, uh, did our mix through, uh, I did some music videos for these guys back when they were running some label stuff. And mm-hmm. my brother is kind of a mid-level rock star. I worked with those guys. And so they did the mix for free. I mean, that's, that was huge. Wow. Yeah. And so I shouldn't say for free. They, they, they deferred <laughs> points. Yeah. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> um, and uh, they're great associate producers. I'm very happy to have worked with them. And if you ever need good post, man, uh, that's where it's at. So, good but, associate producer credit. <laughs> but um, so we we made a dent in that, and then uh, our so that's that's for one theater. So so we had four theaters. Some theaters did better than others, uh, and, and ran multiple nights in in most of them. And so we are now. Oh, that's the other thing. L- let me backtrack a little bit. We didn't have enough money to make the film when we started, but we knew that we could keep making money while we're making the film to keep paying everyone and paying it off. Ooh, and I, that's and I da- think that's a dangerous pl- business plan, sir. Well, is it though? Because the, the, you could either not make your film, you right. could either wait till you have, have your uh, whole budget and not make the film, or you can know that you're going to, uh, you know, you have your day job and you're going to sink a little bit of your paycheck into oh, the Oh, as thing. long as you have a, if you have a revenue stream that you know it's coming to, to cover your nut, then yes, yeah, but I've yeah, seen I, too it, many filmmakers start like we have 10 grand, but we really need 50. We're just going to start. We don't know where the other 40 are coming from. That's dangerous. No, that is dangerous. I don't advise that, but I, I do advise making a film. If you know that you ha- that, that if you don't have the budget all at once, that you're at least going to accumulate the budget, actually accumulate it, not pretend you are, but actually know you're going to earn that money or acquire that money, uh, through production uh, and post mostly in our case. So that, you actually are still making that film. There's nothing worse than having a, you know, a film on your hard drive and waiting for somebody to, to write a check that's not going to happen and you never do it. It's better just to keep moving as best you can. And the other, keep it as cheap as possible. So we're, so this is 30 grand, but this is, th- this is 30 grand over 18 months. That's mm-hmm. still a lot of money, but that's a lot of money in, ver- in, in smaller chunks. So what was, the, what was the total that you actually had to recoup after everything was done? Oh, uh, of our own actual outlay, yeah. right? And investors or donations. Is it all donations or it was investors? All, it, was all, it was all donations or Indiegogo kind of okay. stuff. So like right? actual money you had, like what was the, what was the, the, the to, to make this go into the black? To recoup our personal out-of-pocket ex- uh, expenses, we only needed about eight grand. You know? I mean, if and, you it, and if you can't make eight grand with an independent film, then you really shouldn't be making an independent film. Right. And, and you can do that. And the great thing is, you know, we own it too, you know, and there's, it's part of that. Yeah. And it's part of this growing library and now it lives online and, you know, Amazon sends us the little statements every, you know, and, and so, well, they don't need to send it. I check every day, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but there's, it's better to do, to have done and do and start building your, your intellectual property empire and have something to leverage. And here's the thing with Pillhead. It's not a standalone property. The way I constructed it, it, it speaks to and it actually features other things that I've done. So there's this character who has a book called, called Quantum Deadline uh, that's a kind of a, a MacGuffin in, in the movie, which is also a book that I wrote that's published. And so I'm selling the book in conjunction with the movie. Product right? placement. Product yeah, placement. but it's beyond, but it's not just product placement. It's it's a plot device. It's a, it's transmedia. You see, mm. it's a it's it, they share the same story world. So the movie and the book are, in, are kind of exist in the in the Lumiverse, for lack mm-hmm. of better of a better term. And so uh, that's that's uh, that's how I'm kind of thinking of this long term. It's like keep building in keep building the world and properties that exist within that world and own all of it. And so it could be a longer game. But it's a better game to play, I think. So then, how did you? How was your online marketing game? Like, how did you? Because you know, you have uh, this audience that you're trying to reach. How did you reach this audience? How did you, you know, reach out to this audience, your regional audience, and then also beyond? So what I did uh, first for the regional audience, uh, because we did that cast and crew screening through Eventbrite, which, you know, it's just a, you know, it's a free ticketing service at the level we were doing it, uh, that allowed me to capture all of their emails. So not only did I have my cast and crew emails, I had all their friends and family at that point. Mm -hmm. And so 
so that was a list of you know 300 plus people, which doesn't sound huge, but it is huge when you want your numbers to spike on your on your first day of release. And you say, hey everyone, remember that great time we all had uh, last month or a couple months ago? If you missed it in the theaters, uh, here's here's the chance to really deep dive into this film. And uh, I, I I hope that the film uh, can endure repeat viewings. And so because it's got a lot of Easter eggs and stuff and like that in it. And so uh, that's how we did it. We just did a blast, encouraged everyone to share it. Of course, we leveraged social and all that. And you can triangulate uh, through emails. Uh, like, you know, uh, uh, where people are on different social platforms and you can mm -hmm. invite them to fan, you know, like your fan page and that kind of thing. And so that's how I started. And then uh, I started with press releases and just sending them out to uh, places that I thought would cover the film. And I'm still in that process in trying to trying to push the online. But um, that's a little so th that's a little outside of the regional model. That's a whole different kind of uh it's more traditional than that at this point. It's or another revenue stream. It's a hybrid. It is. It's a hybrid model. Yeah, and you have to keep doing that and keep that alive because it keeps it in the consciousness. And so I send out a press release or some sort of appeal to uh, a reviewer or a blogger, uh, and it, it doesn't have to be like you know a huge uh, place. Any any mention helps, you know. And so uh, that's what I do. And I, it only takes you know it's templatized at this point, so it takes a couple of minutes every day or every every week in my case, uh, and that's what I'm doing. Now, um, and do you, did you use, like, have you built an online community on Facebook at all or on, on different social media platforms? Yeah. I, so I, because I was a local author and all that, I was able to use my, my own kind of presence. Right. And so I'm, I'm generally the face of the film, uh, even though there's a wonderful cast and crew, this, I got to push it. Right. And so through my own Facebook, uh, you know, I, I've got like only 1500 followers, but they're really great. And they're really responsive, and so uh, they're they're not like your tribe where they you know if you ask them to you know march and and uh, take bullets for you. <laughs> I don't do I don't it. know. You're giving way too much credit, <laughs> sir. You're giving me way too much credit. <laughs> My tribe goes, oh, this guy, this asshole again. All right, <laughs> but, but it keeps it it keeps it moving, and uh, and I know it's working because I see I see the, the you know the the hockey stick uh, you know in my Amazon results, but I also get really great feedback uh, for whatever reason. Pillhead is the kind of film that people, if they get into it, want to talk about it and tell me about it, which is really great. And so I've uh, I've met people online who just say, "Hey, I watch your film, man. I really dig it. Did you mean this by that? That kind of thing." They're trying to decode some things. The dude I was speaking with yesterday on the radio uh, kind of nerded out on me. I didn't. I, you know, he was putting out things that weren't, in my opinion, in the film. But I was like, "Yeah, dude." <laughs> <laughs> you <know>? Sure. <laughs> that you you believe that? Let's go for that. And I don't mean that like in a, in a like a you know cynical way. I just mean like you know you know what it's like. People find something that you didn't maybe intend, but that's mm -hmm. important to them, and it's important to let them have that. Oh, you know? I, there's no question. I mean, I, I know Kubrick understood that very well. Um, <laughs> yeah, he was brilliant. Not even talking about anything. You know, just, <laughs> exactly. Just like you guys figure out what I meant. I don't, you know, it's much more interesting. Uh, now, did you, at any point, did you consider doing traditional distribution? Did you go down that road at all? Or was this planned from the beginning and like, we're doing this all the way? Okay. It was planned from the beginning that we were going to make a, like a completely comprehensively unmarketable film. Right. I, and, and that was, in, I mean, it sounds weird. It sounds like a like a, a rationale after the fact, but truly, Alex, uh, uh, my producer and I were like, we had done some conceptual art installations. We were we were all about the creative, and which can be a healthy thing, but also it's not going to make you any money. Right. The idea was to make the film we wanted to make about this place for this place, and that was the audience. So as long as we stood. You know, just kept kept to the the principle like this is a Petaluma film for Petalumans. That was going to be enough to to take it over the the uh, you know the the hump. But um, but there is that little part of you, of course, that goes. It would be cool though if this got picked up, and it would be a hell of a lot easier if it did. Mm. And and so early on, I looked at the distributors that were distributing the kind of films in well the the, a, the, the art house films of of a peculiar kind of psychedelic nature like like this one and uh and it, you know it comes down to like there's the big ones like annapurna and a24 that kind of thing and there's like a little ones like oscilloscope none of those guys wanted to talk to me it's so, it's so and and i knew that and i kind of needed to lob that out there to confirm for myself that i'm i got to stay on my path right and even if they wanted to pick it up, 
it, it, they, I don't think there's the investment for this kind of film. And this film was so regional in its in its scope that it wouldn't make sense really outside in some ways. However, I found it's a little more universal th- thematically than than uh, I'm probably giving it credit for. But but no, I, I you know there's there's a, the the darkness is always lurking, right? And it's and the seduction of of you know breaking through somehow is is always there. But you got to stick to your own thing. Uh, it's the only you know. And then how about film festivals? You didn't decide to go down the film festival route either? I considered it. And I remember looking at the film freeway, you know, uh, lineup and thinking this one looks good. That one looks good. I did the, uh, you know, I, I took pleasure in submitting to Sundance and giving them my hundred dollars to support. It's a a, a fantastic donation. It's fantastic. Yeah. And that's, and I knew that going in, I had never submitted a film to Sundance. I had no uh, delusion that it was going to get in, but I wanted to have participated in that finally. (laughs) Does that make sense? <laughs> it's we're it's it's such a strange such a strange Sundance is such a unique film festival in the in the scope of the world. I mean, unlike any other film festival anywhere in the world, especially for people in the U.S., uh, Sundance is it, and and we know that it's astronomical to get accepted. Right. <laughs> we know we have almost a better chance of winning a lottery or a scratch off than we do of getting our film in. What was last year was like 15,800 submissions yeah. and 120 films got in, including shorts. Yeah. So if you go on the features, it's even less. Like the chances of you getting in are so astronomical. But then we all turn into Jim Carrey and Dumb and Dumber. You're saying, but there's still a chance. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you're saying there's a chance. And yeah. that little dream is what kind of, you know, Look, I I fell into like when I made Ego and Desire, which was a film about Sundance at Sundance, yeah, yeah, at <laughs> Sundance without Sundance permission. I waited nice. a year to submit to them because I was like, if I'm ever going to get a chance, this is it. And <laughs> I wasted a year, you know, I wasted a year of my time, you know, chasing that film festival dream. So I always find it fascinating when film fi- filmmakers now are just saying, you know what, I don't think the film festival route is for me. And it's not for everything. And it's not what it was in the 90s. Like, you know, like Sundance was stamping them out. They don't do that anymore. There is no festival that does that anymore. Right. And festival, the festival culture has changed quite a bit too. And what's considered a festival worthy film is way different. Right. Uh, And uh, not just in terms of like, you know, production value and that kind of thing, but you know, a lot of them want stars. A lot of them want want asses and seats. They want asses and seats. They want press. And that's, Look, it's star, you need star power. There's two ways you get into a film festival. Star powers or that you can prove that you can fill that, th- that, those seats and those showings by your audience, whatever that you – know, if you're a YouTuber who made a film and you say, hey, look, I got 5 million subscribers and I'm going to get – how many seats do you need? 300 filled? Yeah, that's not a problem. Yeah. That's yeah, how we get in. I didn't have that. And so uh, I, I knew that – I, I'd have to like make my own breaks. The other thing was I was I put myself on this timeline, right? I booked the first screening before the film was done, right? Mm-hmm. Because I needed the deadline and I needed to like really push it. And I, I know that sounds a little risky, but we have the technology. You know, it just takes the drive to finish, and that's mm-hmm. what we did. I mean, like up all night, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But it was worth it, and it's exciting, you know. But no, this is not a festival film, man. And that was that was kind of a weird thing to accept, you know, because I had, you know, I'd been as as everyone, we've been through these festivals, we've seen what the culture's like, it's fun. But I, it just has changed, and there's such a, a deluge of content now. Um, uh, and our little black and white weird art flick is just not the kind of thing that's gonna play. You know? it, it, it's it's not and and trust me like i you know with ego and desire i was rejected from all the major festivals i mean i got into rain dance i got a world premiere at rain dance which was huge that's pretty great yeah that was, it was really i was so blessed about that but i was rejected by every other one and i realized i was like you know i i think other festivals just have a big stick up their butt about promoting Sundance at their festival. <laughs> like you don't want to be thinking about another festival while you're at my festival. Oh, that's and, interesting. Yeah. And, and I was like, <laughs> you know, cause anyone who watches the film really enjoys it. It's a filmmaking movie. It's about filmmakers selling a movie at a festival. Like why, why wouldn't that play? It's a perfect film festival movie. But yeah. yet it didn't. So it's odd, man. I've seen, I've look, I've, I've been in over 600 festivals throughout my career with all of my projects it's changed. 
so so much um and, and, you're, and you're taste right. of change yeah tastes are different too i mean like the people who go to film festivals it's it's usually an older demographic now and there's a lot of baby boomers they're kind of looking for the thing that speaks to them you know no one wants your punk rock weird movie you know it's, it's better to project it unless on brad pitt's in it unless brad pitt unless in brad pitt's in it and if brad pitt's in your punk rock movie it's not a punk rock movie anymore man you know what i mean so exactly so you've got no diss that. on brad pitt he's great but <laughs> but there's there there's that whole thing as yeah. well uh, it's it's remarkable, man. But look, and also I wanted to say I saw on your website you have some merch. Have you been selling that merch? Has it made any money? Have you created any revenue off of it? Yeah, and so that that's the thing. I, I put it all on the front page of dhowell dot com, and uh, that uh, that's a constant stream. It's really great, man. It's not like huge, but it's it's definitely buying groceries. That's you know, awesome. I'm selling- yeah, I'm selling the film. I'm selling the books that are related to the film. And on the site, you can you see that I, I kind of make a, explain what I'm doing. Like, this is all one world, and these are the different pieces. And you can you can dive into the book, or you can watch the movie. And there's more to come. And stay with me, and that kind of thing. It's just the beginning, but it's 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 like the foundation, you know, for like a con- personal content empire. You know, <laughs> it's like. Well, that's and, the but that's that's where the future is, man. That is that's I believe truly believe that's where the future of independent film is going. It's not this one movie that's going to get me to where I want to go. It's like it's going to be the grind. It's the yeah. film after film, building a portfolio, not selling out to distributors or or creating some hybrid distribution deal where you maintain some sort of control over your your film. Not for fifteen years, but for five or three right. things. Like you know, there's so many different ways of going about it, and this is the future. I think that what you're doing is fantastic. I think that the, one of the tricks, though, is to keep it coherent in its own universe, mm-hmm. because people want. You know, we see this with binging on Netflix and that kind of thing. I find that audiences, if they're going to invest in your your thing, your story, um, they they want to they want to be like rewarded for for that investment. And you got to do that by giving them another story just like the other one. I'm not saying the same plot or anything. I'm saying like the same world. Allow them to dive into something that you keep building out for them so that keeps them in and interested in that world. I think the – as filmmakers, we want to always do something new and novel and all that. But if you can commit to a story world with characters within it that you can explore, I think that's better. I think it's better to corral everything under some kind of, some kind of unifying concept. Like, you know, I'll use the obvious example of Star Wars. Star Wars is like a world and all this – or universe, frankly, and all this stuff is in it, right? And I, there's no dearth of story material. You can, there's always a new spur or someplace to go. I think if I can encourage anyone, if you, if you want to build a foundation that blossoms into a business, keep it consistent unto itself. Um, and I know that can feel like you're locking yourself into something. But if, if, if at all possible, because synergies develop, Right. And I'm not like selling like, uh, you know, millions of copies of Quantum Deadline, but I've sold more this year with this movie because of the relationship between those two projects uh, than I than I have prior to the, you know, and I'm hopefully one feeds the other, that kind of thing. And as I roll out new material that speaks that plays in the same playground, uh, it'll keep growing exponentially. And that's similar to what I've done with my films with like This Is Meg and, you know, which right. This Is Meg is not specifically a filmmaker movie, but it's a movie about the industry. It's about an actress. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. It's, a, it's about the industry, but it's also, you know, really, a, it's part of my ecosystem of indie film hustle. So yeah. I created multiple revenue streams off of it. In addition to just the actual sales of it and, and licensing it and things like that. But now with ego and desire, which is coming out as of this recording, it's coming out in, a, in less than a month, hopefully uh, that is going to be real product placement and real interesting because that is a product that is designed for the tribe. Like it, it right. is designed for a filmmaker, an independent filmmaker. Like if, I mean, I wanted, if I would see this commercial or I see this trailer, I'll be like, I've got to see that. Right, right. No, that's, that, that's, yeah, totally. That's exactly what I'm talking about. You've, you, that's your niche is kind of turning the camera back on the camera, you know, and, right. and, and exploring the nature of independent film. That's a perfect sweet spot for you. It's great. And right. everything dovetails perfectly. Right, it's a coherent brand proposition. I think you're onto something, and that's that's what I've been trying to do. And I, you know, and shooting for the mob, which is a book about my filmmaking, and then I've got the new book, Rise of the Film. Like, if there's a there's you could see the film entrepreneur aspects of my business. You yeah. know, I, I, I and and you have um, to an extent you you've created multiple revenue streams coming in, and you're not getting you're not retiring off of them. I'm not retiring off of anything. You know, it's it's work, it's a hustle, but it's it's 
It keeps the roof off over my head. Lights totally. are on. Family is fed. We go on a vacation here or there. Life is good, you know? You know, And I live in Los Angeles, for God's sakes. Right, so, yeah. I mean, it's like I wish I lived somewhere else that, you know, my house didn't cost as much, right. <laughs> you know? But I'm here. And in this kind of world that I'm building out as a film entrepreneur is something that's able to sustain me and my family. And, and you're doing, you're doing something similar. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have on the show, man. It's really great stuff, man. Oh, cool. Yeah. There, there's that threshold. I, and I think for me, it's about 18, maybe two years out where I hope that the revenue from all these endeavors begins to catch up and eclipse, you know, the other work I have to do. Uh, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm a writer, so I write regardless. So, you know, I write for clients or I write for magazines and newspapers, that kind of thing. And, but I, I, I feel the tipping points coming and eventually it's gonna, you know, and that's, that's, if you can make it like that, that's the best way to make it, man, where you made it yourself. And, uh, we all have help along the way and all that. Yeah. And we help others along the way, I hope, but, but ultimately you built your own kingdom, you built your own empire, Alex. And, and I think that everyone should endeavor to do that because I think in the, that it, we're going to be a bunch of micro studios in five, 10 years. But that's, you know? but that's the, I, I agree with you hundred percent. We have to be our own businesses. We have to be our own corporations. We have to be our own studios. And I got to that tipping point probably around two, two and a half years in is I got to that tipping point where I just said to my wife, I'm like, I don't think I need to do post anymore. I, you know, if a directing gig comes along, I like it, I'll take it, yeah. you know, but I don't have to do it anymore. And that is the most wonderful feeling <laughs> for someone yeah. who's been hustling for 20 odd years in this business to just wake up every morning and go do what I love to do. It's the dream. It really is the dream. I'm so blessed and humbled by it. And, uh, and that's what you're doing on your end with your films, man. So yeah, congrats, man. Seriously. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. I have to say though, the way you do things, I, I really appreciate the openness and the way that you share how, how you accomplish these things. That's something I'm trying to engineer, figure out a way to incorporate into what I'm doing. So, because the, the give back factor is pretty huge. I mean, as we talked earlier, I, I without uh, listening to uh, indie film hustle and all that and, and kind of keeping the spirit of film alive in my head, uh, I don't think I would have gotten to this point. And I, and I think that, uh, uh, if there's a way that filmmakers filmmakers can bake in some kind of way of of acknowledging or helping kind of keep the community growing, uh, all the better. I don't know what that is for me yet. Perhaps I'll figure it out. But the, as it, as I don't know who said this, but if I forgot who a philosopher said this, but he says if you want to if you want to succeed, help someone else succeed. Right, and and, and it's, then steal from them, I think and then the, obviously then steal from <laughs> them, um, then knock them over the head and take from them. No, uh, but uh, but I've discovered by giving is the greatest strength I have is because I am of service to my community. I give as much as I possibly can. Sometimes I even give too much. I give away ninety five percent of my information for free. And I only charge yeah. for about 5% of what I do every day on a daily basis. You know, I could easily, there's some podcasts that I do, some interviews with some people that I'm like, I could charge 20 bucks for this. This is amazing information. And right. I give it away for free because I, I just found and I discovered that when you pay it forward, man, it comes back to you. And now it's addictive for me. Like I can't not give. I cannot be of service. It's part of my DNA now. So wherever I meet someone or I try, you know, there's only, there's only one of me, so I can't do it as, as much as right, I would right, like, right. but as much as you can give and as filmmakers, you have to find that, that thing inside of you that you want to be of service. And that be of service could be making a regional movie for your community of right. a film. That's a mark. That's a, that's a, a need in that in that marketplace and you're being of service to that community giving them a like that they haven't seen before it doesn't have to be grandiose it could be something very small but when you discover that being of service aspect and you should incorporate that in any way shape or form you can through your work it, it is it's so much better than the me 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 yeah. vibe that i had back in the day when i was coming up when my ego was out of control and all sorts of craziness that i've gone through in my my career that's why i that's why anytime I meet a, a filmmaker, which I'm sure you've met too, who are just so ridiculous. That's why I made Ego and Desire because I just had to had to make fun. <laughs> That's of them. They're so ridiculous that I say it's all good, man. No, I, I <laughs> there's nothing I need to say to you. The business will take care of you. Life will take care of you. Yeah, it's and you might have some <laughs> success here or there, but I promise you, 
the hammer's coming. It, hammer's it always comes. And I don't care who you are, it always comes. So you will be humbled if it's not. Yes. I, it's not me to do it. I won't humble you. It's all, you do you. Do you. <laughs> I, I think that there's a tick in filmmakers. I think filmmakers, are, especially in, in the indie realm, are intrinsically problem solvers, right? Yeah. Constantly figuring out how to do something or fix something or whatever, or patch a hole so, somewhere. And I think when you see problems in, 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 in like the community, like in terms of like accomplishing something or making a film, that kind of thing, like you, the, the, there's an impulse to want to fix it or help somebody like, dude, you're doing this wrong, man. This is how you do it. And I think maybe that's where it comes from at first where you just like, Oh, I got to help this guy. He's a, uh, <laughs> you know, he's going to waste everything here. And I don't know. It's, it's, it's a fascinating place to be. Maybe it's just, maybe I'm just getting older, you know, and there, but, don't underestimate the power of age, brother. I'm telling yeah. you, man. I mean, I look when I was 20, Oh, Oh, I, I would, I would slap myself. You know, it takes years of shrapnel. Uh, it takes that, that, that kind of that rhinoceros skin that you've got to develop because of all the, just the, the, the bruising and the battles and the, and the punches and the, the, the you know, the, the cuts and yeah. the scarring that you have to go through in this business. And I'm not being dramatic. It's the truth. Like we all yeah. go through it. And as you get older, you just start figuring things out. And that's what I try to do with this podcast. I try to like give them a little bit of a shortcut. I, I still want them to go through their pain, but it's, just, it's one thing to be sideswiped by an MMA fighter who's sitting next to you. <laughs> and another thing is if someone says, dude, there is an MMA fighter right next to you and you will be punched any minute now. There's a huge difference between you're going to get punched, but understanding <laughs> – and preparing for that punch is a whole other story. Uh, well put. Yeah, good. The MMA <laughs> metaphor. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's. <laughs> so. I, I always call um, ego is the MMA fighter that sits on your shoulder. That that's what ego is because ego. It'll be he'll be quiet sometimes. You'd be like ah, quiet down, quiet down. He's fine, but he's just waiting for that moment where there's an opening and there's always that moment. And you're like, Hey, maybe I am not that boom. And that's it. You, <laughs> you're out. Like, Hey, maybe I am really this good. Boom. There you go. You're out. And ego is always there waiting for you and you've got to kind of flatten it and it takes uh, forever. So I use that analogy all the time that MMA yeah. fighters always on my shoulder. <laughs> I love it. No, it's good. It's good. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my film entrepreneurs, sir. Yeah. Uh, what advice would you give a film entrepreneur starting a project today? Really focus on the writing. That's the one thing you can do for free yourself and get right uh, with enough uh, practice and dedication to it. Make sure that script is is story worthy and shoot and shooting worthy uh, first. Just you, you can't fix you can't fix bad writing in post. You can edit it around some stuff, but uh, even in my own experience, there are scenes where I go, you know, if I just spent one more day on a draft, I could have cleared up a lot of problems for myself. Just make sure the thing's written first. Write it. Fair enough. Now, what is the biggest lesson you learned from building your company, building what you're trying to do uh, with your film company? So. Go in on uh, getting professional uh, advice for setting it up correctly. If you're going to do an LLC or uh, or sole proprietorship, whatever you're going to do, just make sure you actually set it up as a business and do it legitimately. Sometimes, uh, if you're going to have, uh, if your business is going to have what they call a fictitious name, and by that, mm -hmm. it's like a DBA. name that's not your own. Yeah, DBA. Right. Go through the hoops, check all the boxes. It, it's worth it, and and it sets you up for success. You don't want to have to like mess with your taxes. You don't want to have to mess with all the stuff that's just, just going to slow you down artistically. Do it right, and if you have to pay a little bit for it, do that. And get an accountant. And yeah, get that's a great point. Accountants, <laughs> get, you know, get an accountant. It's cheap. <laughs> Totally. A bookkeeper is, for, is it's way cheaper than you think. You know, and, it's a lot and cheaper I, than you doing it yourself, man. I can tell you that much. <laughs> especially when you mess it up. Yeah. Especially in production, having a bookkeeper. I didn't didn't have one in Pillhead, and I really wish I did because it would have been so much easier just to have it happening every week. Everyone gets paid versus, mm -hmm. dude, can I get my check? It's midnight. I'm, you know, like we're Hold only. Hold on. Let me get let me get the book out. <laughs> yeah. No. Just. <laughs> Pay the two hundred bucks or whatever. It's nothing. Yeah. yeah you know. It's no, it's 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 a good ROI and an ROT. Return on time uh, and return on investment. Ah, yes. Be yeah. Because yeah. you know, a lot of us are as filmmakers, especially us us guys who are at the micro budget level, we always want to save a buck, but you've got to be smart on where you save it because if you save five dollars, but if you pay that five dollars, and that five dollars will save you an hour or two in work or time. Does it make, is your time worth more than $5? 
Right. Could you be right. doing something else that could generate more revenue or, or help the project farther along? That is such a huge, huge thing. That's a great point. Let the pros do the pro stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. Fair, yeah. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Now, what, is, what did you learn from your biggest business failure? Mm, well, that wasn't necessarily this, this business. project. No, no, yeah. no, not in this business in general. Um, there's a lot of people who are often not invested in your success. Shocking. And yes. And it's, it's important to recognize that and get rid of them early. Uh, not that anyone may be intentionally sabotaging you, but they may unconsciously have a grudge and you might be carrying them with you and you want to drop them as soon as you can. We, we see this in creative stuff sometimes, you know, some, just not all the time, just sometimes, just sometimes <laughs> <laughs> those yeah. guys suck. You know, there's just, there, there are energy vampires, you know, that, uh, they want to be close to you because you got the thing and, uh, they don't, and they're going to take it from you bit by bit. Drop by drop. And it's uh, paper cuts. Death by paper yeah. cuts. Yeah. And they may not even know they're doing it. Get rid of them. Mm -hmm. It's okay to get rid of them. Yeah. It took me a long time to figure that out. Long yeah. time to figure that out. Uh, now, in your opinion, what is the definition of a film entrepreneur? A film entrepreneur is someone who endeavors to make filmmaking their life, uh, their life and livelihood. And uh, by... Uh, pragmatic and judicious execution of uh, their uh, their talent in uh, the cinematic space. Uh, you, a, are a, a, you are a wordsmith, sir, obviously. I don't know. That sounds a little put on. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me try that again. <laughs> I, was, I was reaching there. Um, uh -huh. now, a, film, a, film, a film entrepreneur is, is somebody who, who knows that to make films, they have to make films that, that sustain them ultimately. And so uh, by, by being smart as, as, as well as uh, uh, pragmatic uh, is the way to go. Now, where can people find you, your movie, and what you're doing? Yeah, I'm at uh, D Howell. That's D H O W E L L dot com. And if you want to go directly to the business, it's culture department dot com. It's culture D E P T dot com. I'm at Facebook at Daedalus Howell doc. Daedalus, don't even bother. I can't even spell it. Never mind. <laughs> but D Howell dot com. There's links everywhere, I swear. <laughs> so. And then Pillhead's on Amazon. Go to Amazon and watch Pillhead. You can see how I did it. Yeah. Is it on Prime or is it on just rental? And, uh... It's on Prime. Yeah. Oh, nice, fantastic! Are you finding that you're making a little, you're making good money on Prime as opposed to rental and and purchase? That's a great question. I I'm finding it's not quite as juicy at, in terms of Prime, but I'm Prime's kind of a long term play for me because I'm trying to push it a lot, and it's easier to get people to watch it if they're not paying out of pocket. You sure. Know, like, it's a little frictionless, and so I'm kind of in a in a marketing push right now, and so I'm sending out links to uh, you know uh, uh, bloggers and stuff like that. I want them to be able to click it, watch it, love it, talk about it. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. So yeah, there's a bit of a little bit of a decline, but you know, I, the great thing about Prime though, it's like it's it's opened up in U the UK now, so the film's kind of getting a different audience, that kind of thing. Less friction, long term play. I'm a little, I'm I'm still on the fence about it a little bit, to be honest. But you're, huge, you? but you're huge in Turkey, so that's all really that matters. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You can't walk the streets in Turkey, sir. So I can anyway, as it turns out. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brother, yeah. man, I appreciate you coming on and being so uh, transparent and, and forthcoming with uh, the tribe, man. So thank you so much for dropping those knowledge bombs, brother. Oh, thanks for having me, man. This is a real privilege and pleasure. I really, truly appreciate it, man. Thank you. I want to thank Dayla so much for coming on and sharing his knowledge bombs with the tribe today. If you want to check out his movie or links to anything we talk about in this episode, please head over to the show notes at filmtrepreneur.com forward slash zero two five. And for everyone who has signed up for Indie Film Hustle TV, I just wanted to give you an update. We have a bunch of new courses that I'm uploading the story blueprint by Michael Haig and Chris Vogler, The Heroes Two Journeys, a breakdown, a detailed breakdown of the story structure of the Oscar-winning film, Aaron Brockovich, and much, much more. And I am uploading exclusive film entrepreneur interviews that have not been released on the podcast yet. You'll, you'll be able to listen and watch those full interviews first on IFH TV. So I'll be putting those up as well moving forward. And I will be creating specific film entrepreneur training to enhance 
the book and to go deeper into what you learned in Rise of the Film Entrepreneur. And that will all be available on Indie Film Hustle TV. If you want to check it out, head over to ifhtv.com. Thank you so much for listening, guys. I hope that this episode was of value to you on your film entrepreneurial journey. Thanks for listening. As always, the power is in your hands. Be a film entrepreneur. And viva the revolution. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Film Entrepreneur Podcast at filmtrepreneur.com. Give your mornings a remix with a delicious new Beyond Sausage Sandwich from Dunkin'. Say what? It's a tasty Beyond Meat Sausage Patty with egg and cheese all on an English muffin. Oh, yeah! That's 10 grams of great-tasting plant-based protein. Great-taste plant-based? Wait, it's plant-based? Yeah, it's plant-based. And it tastes great. Yummy! Try Dunkin's Beyond Sausage Sandwich. It's a whole new way to start the day. America runs on Dunkin'.